All right, this is our notes on arthropods. Uh, we've been going through the invertebrate groups, starting with periphera, then we went through cnidarians, uh, we looked at some mollusks, we looked at annelids, uh, and yeah, now we're on to arthropods. And uh, this could be the most diverse group that we've covered so far. We've looked as we've gone through these uh, groups how more and more and more complex they become. And this is one of our last groups we're going to look at. And you see here this first note, it's the largest group or phylum of invertebrates. If you took all the invertebrates, put all the numbers together or phylums, or you would see arthropods is just so much larger than all the other ones. They, just a huge percentage of all invertebrates are arthropods. <clears throat> the name arthropod, pod is foot, and arthro is jointed. So you're going to see these organisms that have like these legs, kind of like our limbs as well, that have joints like knees and such. And, and you'll see when we look at some of these, like spiders and insects, if you've ever looked closely at their legs, they're jointed as well. Even some of these joints down here. So they have several joints on their appendages. And uh, these appendages can be antenna. We usually don't think of appendages. When we think of appendages, we usually don't think of antenna. We usually think of legs and such. But really, we can have these antenna. It's kind of interesting because they're jointed as well. If you ever looked at one. Okay, so and we know antenna are for like uh, sense of smell and other things in the environment. They use them for that. Some for balance as well. But they can be more than legs and more than claws. And some of them even have these things called swimmerettes, which are just little thin, feathery type structures. But they're jointed as well. And these are for like swimming. So you can have like legs, you can have antenna, and you can have swimmerettes. And they're just many jointed. They can go in many different directions. It's really an adaptation or a design in their. Um, a design that just really helps them be well fit for their environment. <clears throat> and that's the, one of the main ones, a jointed foot. The other main, one of the, the second of the three is an exoskeleton. So an exoskeleton is a outer skeleton, so it's on the outside, and it's uh, like our skeleton is on the inside, we call that an endoskeleton. This is on the outside, and everything attaches uh, from the outside and goes inward, their organs and such, and their muscle. But it's an outer skeleton. Uh, it, um, it's also very hard, tough, hard to break through. Gives them a great advantage uh, against prey. And if you ever walked along and like had a beetle or something near you and you stepped on it and you heard that crunch, that's an exoskeleton. Very, very advantageous design as well. And you don't see this in uh, mollusks. A mollusk would have a an actual shell covering, like a like a mussel. But this is a little different. The, the you think of the shell that a bivalve has or a mussel. That's pretty heavy. And uh, some of them are modified in them, like the cephalopods with squid. They're much smaller. And uh, even gastropods, some of them don't have a shell at all. But the snail, that's a really large shell. And even nautili and such cuttlefish, they have some really heavy shells. Well, this one, it's an exoskeleton. It has this hard outer covering, but it's not so heavy. It's kind of light. And that's advantageous. It gives it protection. But it's also not so heavy that it can't move very easily. Now, these guys have bilateral symmetry. And if we were going to look at like a basic insect, which is also an arthropod, so it has head, thorax, and abdomen if it's an insect, then it would have three legs on it on the thorax. Okay, and if we went right down the middle and cut it in half, we would have a right and left side. And that's what we have here with these guys, bilateral symmetry. If we keep going, the third main characteristic of arthropods is a segmented body. Uh, if you ever look at a crayfish uh, or a um, grasshopper, an ant, segments, right? So we have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. We have three sections, so segments. You can also look at a crayfish. It kind of has this like large frontal structure. It's called a cephalothorax, CT. 
kind of a joint it's kind of a joined appendage but then if you look at a crayfish or even a lobster it has more segments attached like right here okay eventually going into like a tail as well okay and then you'd have legs down here if it's a crustacean it has five pair and then it might have a claw up here like Mr. Krabs and then it might have some antenna and then it might need some little thick places for the eyes, this rostrum. And then, uh, yeah, and it has some small antennules as well. Okay, but that's a crayfish segment. It has this front segment and segments that attach to it. This front cephalothorax has legs and such. And then this would be swimmerettes we were talking about. Attached back here, help them swim in the water. So, but segmented bodies, and if you remember, we've seen this in another organism or another phylum, Annelida. But the difference here is these are very specialized. If you remember, if you look at an earthworm, we'll just draw a basic one here, and they have segments that just repeat, right? And they might have a little square structure in here called a clitellum. But then all the other structures are basically the same. They're just repeating over and over again, but they're the same. And they might have some setae on them. Each of these segments are really the same segment. They're not really that different. But here we have segmentation, but specialization of the segments where they each have their own job. So here you see these have walking legs. So that's for moving. This section we could say is for moving around and holding of the organs. This section here is swimmerettes for swimming. Uh, there's some other functions as well. And even on this, we have the this section we have the eyes and the antennas. So we know sensory organs are on this section. So very specialized for uh, specialized functions. And this few segments is the cephalothorax. I'm going to call it CT. You're going to have to look up how to spell that. But cephala is head, and thorax is would be your middle region of an insect. They're fused together. Okay, what makes this group really special as well, and I'm going to erase this, is they also have a large variety of eating habits. So they all don't eat the same thing. So competition is not as great between them. So if you have a crustacean, which is one of the groups down here, and you have a chelicerata, or you have a unirama, some of them are omnivores, which means they eat plants and animals. Some are carnivores, just eat other living things. Herbivores, just plants. And they can be insectivores, they can be detritivores, which eats dead decaying matter. There's just tons of them, okay? But there are a variety, so they all just don't do one thing. They do many different, they eat many different types of things. So very specialized. And so if you're, if you're a butterfly, how you eat is very different than if you're a crayfish. And they're both arthropods. So they have specialization of that part of their body to help them eat what they eat. Okay, so large variety of eating habits make them very unique. And then also, the largest group is insects. I forget, I think it's 75% of all animals. You might want to double check that, but I think that's right. So 75% of all animals are insects. The, in, the numbers are enormous compared to, like, if we wanted to number each insect and compare it to how many people there are, it's not even close. Even if you took the mass, took all the insects, put them in on a scale and see how much they weighed, compare them to all the people and see how much they weighed, the insects would greatly outnumber all their organisms. So then we look at the main groups though. First we have Chelicerata, then we have crustaceans, and then we have Unirama. In Chelicerata we have spiders, which can also be called arachnids. Okay. And then we also have um, horseshoe crabs, which are these really primitive looking things. They live in the water. Most of these spiders do not live in water. Most live on land or terrestrial. Horseshoe crabs live in the water, and they have this really strange, they have some strange things. They look very old. They'd probably really scare you. They kind of have this like shape, like a, a rounded shell like this. Some people say they're really old and they have this other structure here with a tail on it. Okay, and then they have these two eyes right here. These are very big. Like you could put your foot across them, they're so big. And they kind of swim through the water. They lay their eggs on land actually, but they live a long time and uh, don't really hurt people, but they're just a crab under this shell and uh, 
called horseshoe crabs. You've probably never seen one if you've lived in Alaska your whole life. But you should look one up and see what they look like. Uh, so these are racist. So then scorpions, you know, these are terrestrial. They have a stinger okay, and so on. So those are all chelicerata. There's some examples. There's other ones, but these are just the ones you know. And then crustaceans are shrimp, crabs, lobsters, crayfish, and barnacles. The thing that makes this one different mainly is they're aquatic. They live in water. There's a few, I think there's one or two that don't, and one is a pill bug. It's considered a crustacean as well. And you think about these guys, so live in water. These guys do not, except for the horseshoe crab. They're terrestrial, but also uh, these guys have five pairs of legs, or appendages. They're kind of, sometimes they call them decapods, or ten total. So you can look at the number of appendages they have attached to them, and you might be able to discern which group they have, because spiders, right, they have eight octopods, maybe. So eight uh, appendages total, four pair. And horseshoe crabs, they have, might have more. Scorpions, I'd have to, I'm not sure if they have a, if their decapod might fit into this as well. But these guys are aquatic. Scorpions are not, so they don't fit into this group. Aquatic organisms, five pairs of legs, and so on. Okay, and then Unirama is the insects. Included in Unirama are centipedes and millipedes. Insects, uh, just amazing. And they have three pairs of legs, so six total. pair and um, they also have wings okay now that's insects if you look at centipedes and millipedes they do not okay they have these guys almost look like worms because they're really long many many segments okay they have some other characteristics that helps them fit into unirama Okay. Now this you could break this group down even further call it insecta there's Heridia, I can't remember the name of it, but Insecta. So even though this basic group, group Unirama has centipedes and such, we could break this down further and then you'd see why, how insects are different than these guys. But that's kind of your arthropod uh, introduction. Three main groups. Uh, we also have the main, three main characteristics. Make sure you know these. Uh, exoskeleton. Uh, jointed appendages and segmented bodies with specialization. So if you're going to say what makes arthropods different than annelids, what makes them different than mollusks, these three things. No exoskeleton in those. There's segmentation in annelids but not specialized and jointed appendages, none of them have that. Okay, you look at a squid, it just has a long tentacle, right? It's not jointed. There's no joints in it, so it can move different ways. Okay, that's your arthropods. Make sure you annotate these and turn them in to me.